Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you a little bit about uh, climate solutions. I'm so excited to hear uh, what everybody's great ideas are going to be. Uh, so I work for an organization called Project Drawdown that's been thinking a lot about um, uh, climate change solutions. You may have seen some of the work we've done in the past. Uh, I just joined the organization a couple of months ago, and we're about to launch kind of Drawdown 2.0, which I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about, but more uh, importantly, to help set the stage for some of the conversation today. Um, when you think about climate change or any of the broad sustainability challenges we face, I think it's really important to you know, start with the kind of big picture, um, just to frame it once. Um, humans or something like us, something like our ancestors, early, early, early human-like creatures, started walking on this planet about six million years ago, right? And just think about that. That's six million years, do the math, uh, about 300,000 generations of something like us has been walking around this planet. And for almost all of that time, for 299,998 of those generations, one fact was undeniably true. Uh, we could just be doing whatever the hell we wanted because the Earth was essentially infinite. And we were very, very small. So we could use up resources, we could change the environment, we could increase our population and just keep doing it because the planet didn't even really notice. But that suddenly changed in the last two generations and now we're in a race to live in a very finite planet because suddenly we got very big and now the Earth seems incredibly small. So along with this whole backdrop are incredible changes. Just think of the last 50 years. Uh, we've more than doubled the human population in 50 years. We increased the economy, the economic activity of our planet, adjusted for inflation by eightfold. So twice as many people doing eight times more stuff. We've tripled the consumption of food. We've doubled the use of water. And we've roughly tripled the use of fossil-based energy in just 50 years. So that's the problem. And you know, we've changed more of this planet in the last 50 years than we did in all of human history combined before. So this is a really, really important point. We're, we're at an inflection point in human history. That's the bad news. Uh, and I'm an environmental scientist, and we have to start with that. It's, it's in our contract, OK? And we're supposed to bum you out. Otherwise, we didn't do our jobs. But I know this is a room full of entrepreneurs and optimists, and people who believe in abundance and other things. So at the same time, we've had all these kind of challenges. We have incredible opportunities. Uh, we now live much longer lives. The average person on Earth 50 years ago lived to be 55. Today, it's over 70. Women oh, 50 years ago, on average on the planet, had over five children. Today, it's about 2.4. That's incredible, much faster than we ever expected. We're more literate, we're more urban, we're obviously more connected, more technologically based, more mobile, and we're also uh, safer and less violent people than anybody who's ever lived on this planet. So there are a lot of really good things happening too. So the question that we all face, of course, is, you know, which is it in the Dickensian sense? Is it the best of times, the worst of times? And of course, the answer is, it's up to you. Uh, which world do you want? Which world do you decide to build? And how are we going to face it? And climate change will be one of the defining issues about how we determine what world we want, how we're going to live into the future, and what world we leave generations that come after us. So climate change is clearly a defining issue. Uh, here's the kind of take-home graph of you know, putting it in perspective. Where are the red dot? The little white wiggles before it is basically all of our existence before that. We have already driven Earth out of any kind of geologic norms due to our activities, mainly burning fossil fuels, but a lot of other stuff I'll mention as well. So this should give us a little bit of pause, and this is the magnitude of the challenge, and that little red dot is increasing uh, very, very rapidly moving into the future. I was born when, you know, instead of years, we should, in calendar years, we should, oh, I was born in 330 parts per million. How about you? Uh, this year is 412 or whatever, you know, happy CO2 day or whatever, you know. So here we are. What we call, this is a choice between disaster, we just keep piling the pollution into the atmosphere, letting it run amok, substantially altering this planet beyond anything we've seen in recent geologic history, certainly anything we've seen in human history. Or we could do something else, and we call that drawdown. The idea that right now pollution's going up, but we can imagine a point in the future where instead of it just getting less bad, we actually start to turn it around and bring pollution back down so that CO2 levels are restored to their natural state, like 270 parts per million, which it had been for many, many years before that. So that's what we call drawdown, that point in the future, and we organized a whole place around that idea. So our thesis, and I think the one that a lot of you are in the room for too, is like, hey, this is actually doable. Um, guess what? We can stop global warming. We can even potentially reverse it in the long term. 
And this point we call drawdown is doable with technologies that exist today. Absolutely it is, and I'll show you how a little bit. But also with new technologies coming down the road, it's only gonna get better, cheaper, and easier. So stop thinking this is hopeless. It is not. If you think climate change is only doom and gloom, you've made a choice, and it's a bad one. And uh, you know it's a really bad choice you just made because there are other choices available right now and more coming that's a different choice that can build a better, safer world, and you just chose to ruin it. You don't have to. So let's do a better job. So um, our little organization, and I, can, I can't take any credit for this work because I wasn't there for it, uh, but what we call kind of Drawdown 1.0 was a group of uh, writers and scientists and uh, kind of wonks, basically, who got together and said, hey, what are the solutions to climate change? Can we evaluate them, kind of compare them in an apple to apple to apple kind of way? Strangely, nobody had ever done that before. And maybe, I don't know, could we like write it down or something and share it with the world? Nobody had done that before either. So Drawdown did a pretty good job of discovering at the state about two, three years ago, what was the state of the art of climate solutions and wrote it down and it became a best-selling book. Um, this is actually the third most popular book in, on climate change ever written in English history, uh, which is pretty cool. We're chasing Al Gore. He's about to lose the spot of number two with Inconvenient Truth. But he still owns number one with Earth in the Balance. So he'll, don't feel bad for Al, he'll be fine. So this book has done really well and it's gotten in a lot of different places. And what it said was pretty interesting. It said there's a whole bunch of solutions out there and we didn't come up with any of them. All of them existed already. We just compared them with some math and a bunch of analytical stuff and we wrote them all down in one convenient little place. So these solutions already existed. We took to 80 of them that existed today, were viable right now, and 20 that we called coming attractions that were things coming down the pike. And I think we're gonna hear about many, many more today, which would be very exciting. We're actually updating this whole thing again right now. And by mid-year, we're gonna have a whole new set of uh, Drawdown 100 solutions informed by the very latest economics, technology, and science, and we'll give it away to the world. So before we do that, though, and I think this is important, and I used to be a professor for a long time, so it's really important that people kind of know the chemistry and the physics of the problem, I think. I'm not, I don't want to bore you with this, but can I just, if you remember one thing, can you remember climate change is not just an energy problem, please? Uh, climate change is about a 60% an energy problem. 40% of it is something else, okay? So if, even if you fixed all of the electricity problems in the world, that's only 25% of the problem. If you fixed all the energy problems in the world, you've got 60% of it covered. You still forgot about 40% of it. Why? Because there's more than one greenhouse gas. CO2 is the big one, but it's released from burning fossil fuels and from agriculture and land use, and cement, the curing of cement. If cement were a country, it'd be the third largest emitter in the world after China and the United States. And yet it gets almost no attention compared to, let's say, electricity. So we really need to think about these other gases and where they come from. CO2 comes from three places, energy, land, cement, and other chemicals. But there's also methane. That's really important from landfills, cattle, and swamps and rice fields, all sorts of stuff. Nitrous oxide, that comes from overusing fertilizers. Huge greenhouse gas here, and yet most people don't even talk about it. And then we have what we call the F gases. They are the gases you give the finger to, sorry. Um, they're the fluorinated gases, things like hydrofluorocarbons that are used in refrigerants and air conditioners, but also things like sulfahexafluorine, uh, which are used in chemicals to insulate transformers or electrical grids. Uh, there's all sorts of other so-called super pollutants, but I'm just gonna be a champion for the other gases and the other sectors besides the energy sectors because we that ain't the whole board. And in climate change, we get a look at the whole board, folks. So that's kind of the chemistry of the problem, and this is the economics of it. Uh, this is where this stuff comes from. The single biggest contributor to climate change as a human activity is making electricity, but it's only 25% of it. In California, it's about 12% of our emissions come from making electricity. So when you hear you know, renewable energy, what they usually mean is renewable electricity, which is only a subset of energy, and that's really a small part of the problem. And it's also the one that's getting cheapest, fastest, it hit Moore's law already. So we're gonna move beyond electricity. The next biggest is food and land use. It's about the same number, 24%. So if you deal with electricity and the food system, you get half the problem right there. After that is kind of industry writ large, there's a million things under that big umbrella. I'd actually focus more on transportation and buildings if I were you. 
and other things like that. So again, look at the whole board and realize there's a lot of different sectors that you got to look at to really solve the climate problem. Electricity, yes, but number right tied, exactly tied with it is agriculture, food, and land use. And then we have industry as a whole, transport, buildings, materials, like cements, refrigerants, super pollutants, and so on. So um, that's cool. Under all that, those are kind of the immediate things that give rise to greenhouse gas pollution. But under that, of course, is us, humans, that are doing this stuff. So that's why at our project, we also look at things like foundational things that affect the future of everything, like how many people live on Earth. So that's why we talk a lot about population, but really through the lens of empowering uh, young women and girls around the world, because when you do that, you change everything. And if we can change the world from hitting 11 billion people to 9 billion people while helping half of humanity at the same time, that's a good day. So we emphatically insist that working with people and empowering women especially is a crucial climate solution, as is working with indigenous communities. So some of the solutions to climate change are talked about a lot. Uh, they get a lot of attention, like solar and wind and all these things. Of course, we need those. Those are great. Solar's already hit Moore's Law. Batteries are soon behind. These things are going like gangbusters. Really good stuff. Other solutions need more love, too. It's not just electricity, as I said, like protecting our forest. Huge climate solution. We rank that in the top 40. Eating a less meat-rich diet into a plant-rich diet. That's our number four climate solution uh, on the planet. It's huge. Uh, again, it, like cement, if food waste were also a country, it would also be number three in the world after China and the US, actually bigger than cement. So that's huge. That's food waste. So diets and food waste are the number three and number four solutions to climate change out of 100. So don't forget the food. It's really, really important. What are some solutions that people don't talk about at all? Well, the number one solution to climate change we found in our analysis was actually nothing to do with CO2 at all. It was refrigerants. The gases inside air conditioning units, refrigerators and freezers, are called hydrofluorocarbons. They replaced an earlier chemical called chlorofluorocarbons, which destroyed the ozone layer. Hydrofluorocarbons are ozone-friendly, but they're not climate-friendly. They actually are incredibly powerful greenhouse gas. And so one of the best things we can do is to make sure those things never, ever, ever escape and drift into the atmosphere. So one of the really big opportunities for climate change is to go to every landfill on the planet and make sure we recover these damn things and chemically destroy the hydrofluorocarbons and not let them get into the atmosphere. A company called uh, Intuit that makes like TurboTax and stuff like that, they actually sent a whole team of engineers to Ghana to destroy uh, refrigerants that were being basically dumped into landfills there. And it was a much more cost-effective way to prevent climate change than planting trees or solar panels, which we should also do. So that's pretty cool. I mentioned this. It turns out helping people protect their own lands often keeps those forests more carbon-rich, sequestering and storing more carbon out of the atmosphere. So every study ever shown in the literature is if you help indigenous peoples, especially in places like Brazil, keep their land intact and not just torn up for palm oil or soybeans or beef, you help protect climate as well, as well as biodiversity and the people who live there. Totally good idea. And I mentioned this already, but uh, helping women help themselves, especially young women, making choices about how they want to live and how many children they want to have and when they have it, turns out to be hugely crucial to the future of our climate. So we actually put family planning and educating girls are number six and number seven. You put those two together, they're probably the single biggest or one of the biggest climate solutions there ever would be, and with so many other human benefits. This is a wonderful TED Talk by my colleague, uh, Catherine Wilkinson, uh, which just came out, if you want to check it out, it came out on TED about two, three months ago, about the intersection of gender and climate change. And uh, she and others like to point out, uh, she was in a talk once where somebody said something like, well, I don't believe in the climate, the man-made climate change. And as a feminist, she really bristled at man-made, and then said, oh, wait a minute. Climate change is a man-made problem, damn it. <laughs> you know, look around, look at the oil companies, look at these guys. It's a man-made problem, but it has feminist solutions. So this is a Drawdown 100 list from uh, last year. Uh, it's about two years old, basically, it's state-of-the-art then, uh, where we get refrigerants. But these are the solutions we stacked up, at least in one scenario. This would achieve Drawdown closer to 2060, 2070 time frame. If you want to do it sooner, you get different solutions. If you want to do it later, you get different solutions. It depends when you want to do this. The good news, the bottom line, is it's doable. You don't have to break the laws of physics to fix climate change. You just have to get off your ass and do some things. We can do that. And you're adding new technologies and solutions to this all the time. 
Drawdown was really kind of the first time people bothered to write it down. Like, what can we do about climate change? Let's look at the numbers and let's share it with the world. That was pretty cool. And the more important thing, that wasn't just the technical analysis, is the way we talked about it was pretty brilliant. Uh, Paul Hawken, Catherine Wilkinson, a bunch of other folks who really wrote the book, uh, did some amazing things by you know, shifting the narrative. And that turns out to matter too. Technology is not the only thing. We're not just technically limited in waiting to get to a climate safe future. We're culturally limited too. I know that sounds weird to a room full of like PhDs and investors, but if we don't believe in a better future, you're not going to get to a better future. So the rhetoric needs to change too. We stop talking about the problem. Let's talk about solutions. Stop using fear. Let's talk about opportunity. And stop talking about conflict like they're the bad guys. How about invite collaboration? We can solve it together and it's gonna be good for us. So I don't wanna forget that amongst all the technology discussions. So now what? Uh, well, our little organization is going to draw down 2.0. Uh, they brought me on. We're gonna kind of do some more stuff, which we're really excited to collaborate with you all. We're moving beyond just the research and describing Drawdown. We want to go out and help it happen. So this is where we'd love to collaborate with a lot of you. Our first uh, job is to create a global commons, a kind of go-to place for climate solutions, a trusted, honest broker that's non-commercial, non-partisan, and just really good at this stuff. And it doesn't exist right now. Well, we're going to do that. And we'd love to work with you to make that happen. Sort of, you know, where does everybody go to learn about the latest on climate solutions? It'll be drawdown.org. Two, we want to make sure that the world starts to feel inspired about climate solutions, not to fear the future, but to embrace it and shape it. So uh, we have a campaign that we're going to be launching pretty soon with some partners to reach about a billion people. Our book reached a few million. I want to add a few zeros and say, hey, if a billion people around the world really believe and dig in that climate change is not hopeless, it's in fact an opportunity to make a better world, then that's going to change the world. And then third, we want to help people uh, get out there and implement these drawdown solutions at scale as quickly and safely as possible with equity and justice in mind as well. And here we would like to work with a lot of you to move about a trillion dollars of economic activity over the next five years. Not just the capital, but activities in cities. Our three partner areas are going to be cities, the Fortune 500, and of course philanthropy and investment. So billion people, trillion dollars, let's do it. Um, but before we do that, we need to achieve drawdown. And I just want to leave you with one last thought is, you know, I hope we uh, feel really ambitious today, really hopeful about changing the world. I really like the energy in this room already. And let's go out and build that better future and remind ourselves we've done this before. There have been times in our past where we pulled together and thought of a dream of the future and we work really hard, sometimes imperfectly, sometimes not with every success we want, but we have found visions and leadership to get us there. We've been challenged with a dream of the future. Let's stop arguing about the nightmares of the future and embrace a dream of a better future. Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a nightmare. He said, I have a dream. And it was a tough dream, a hard one, and we didn't quite get there yet. But it's one that has inspired billions of people around the world. And we've had others asking us to be less selfish and to pull together and think of the collective good, whether it's your nation or the next generation, or embracing that kind of unspoken covenant that the next generation should live at least as good a life as we did and let's be good ancestors, and let's build a better future for them. We've done it before, and we can certainly do it again with people like this in this room, making that better future. So with that, thanks, and I uh, look forward to hearing from all of you and what we can do together today. <laughs>